Welcome to this second video on finding indefinite integrals or antiderivatives. And in this video, we're going to be working some examples. So first, we're just going to work through several indefinite integral problems. And then we're going to work an application problem that uses indefinite integrals. Let's remind ourselves what the rules for indefinite integrals are. Here we have the power rule. So if we're going to do integral of x to the n dx, we increase the exponent by 1 and divide by the new exponent. And this only works for when n does not equal negative 1. If n equals negative 1, then we have to use this alternate rule down here, which is the log rule. Both of these rules are just for when you have something like the integral of 2 dx. And remember, if you have the derivative is 2, then the original function has to look like 2x and then plus c. Don't forget your plus c. Those are important. So we have our log rule, and then we have our exponential rules. And e to the x is pretty self-explanatory because the antiderivative of e to the x is just itself. If we have a different base for our exponential, then we're going to have to use this b to the x antiderivative rule. And we're going to have 3 to the x, but we have to divide by that factor of natural log of 3, and then plus c. So let's go ahead and start with this first problem here. We have to evaluate this indefinite integral. And what we're going to do is we're going to go term by term. So we're going to have 3 over x dx plus the integral of 6e to the x dx minus the integral of 5x cubed dx. And then I can take those constant multipliers and put them out in front of my integral sign. You don't have to do this step, but this is just hopefully helps you see how the rules get used. Now notice I haven't done the antiderivative yet. All I've done is I've rewritten this and separated things out. And so I still have my integral sign and my dx. In this next step, I'm going to do the antiderivative. So the integral of 1 over x, this is the case in that power rule where we have x to the negative 1 dx, which is the integral of 1 over x dx. And remember, we have a special rule for this, and this is the log rule. So this is going to be the natural log of absolute value of x. Now I could put a plus c here, but I'm just going to put 1 plus c at the end, and that'll take care of any constant. Here I'm going to have 6 integral of e to the x is just e to the x. And in this last one, I'm going to have 5x to the 3 plus 1 divided by 3 plus 1. And now I have my plus c. So notice that I've done my antiderivative on all three terms. And my integral sign and my dx has disappeared. And in place, I have that plus c. So I want to write this one last time. And I want to simplify this exponent here. So I'm going to have minus 5x to the fourth divided by 4 plus c. Now remember that this process here of finding the antiderivative is exactly opposite the process of finding the derivative. So if we take what we have as our answer here and we take the derivative, I should end up with my original thing inside. So the derivative of 3 natural log of x is 3 times 1 over x. We're just going to kind of ignore the absolute values. That's OK. And then here, the derivative of 6e to the x is just 6 e to the x. Here, I'm going to have 5. I'm going to have 4x cubed, and that's over 4. And the derivative of the c is 0. Notice how these 4s cancel out. And so here, for this one, I have 3 over x, so that matches. 6e to the x, that matches. And here, I have 5, and I have an x cubed, so that matches. So we did our antiderivative, or my definite integral, correctly. Next, let's look at this indefinite integral. Now we've got a couple of things going on that are different in this particular one. First, notice I've got a square root. I've got these decimal exponents. And then I also have an x in the denominator. So when we were doing the derivative, our first step was always to rewrite. And that's going to be the case in our integrals also. So if I rewrite this, there's nothing I need to do in that first term, but actually it's helpful if I separate the coefficients from 
my power of x. So I'm going to have one-third x to the 2.4. In this second term, I want to rewrite that square root as x to the one-half, just like I did with my derivatives. And in this last term, I want to put that x in the numerator, but I'm going to have it, it's going to be to the negative 0.4 and then I have a plus 2 at the end. So in this one, let's skip the step of separating it, out, separating it out into multiple integrals. Let's just do the integral. So I'm going to have 1 third. Now I'm going to raise this exponent by 1, so I'm going to have 2.4 plus 1, so that's going to be to the 3.4 and over the new 3.4 exponent. Plus here, I'm going to have 6x to the 1 half plus 1. So 1 half plus 1, that gives us 3 halves. And that's going to be divided by 3 halves. Minus 7, I'm going to have x to the negative 0.4 plus 1. So let's do that off on the side. Negative 0.4 plus 1, that gives us a positive 0.6. And this is over 0.6. And then in this last one, I'm just going to have 2x, and then I have a plus c. So I've gone through and I've done my antiderivative because I have used the power rule on each term. And so my integral sign is now gone, as is my dx, and in its place I have that plus c. Now, I do not want to leave this like this. I want to simplify a bit. So let me show you some tricks for simplification. So first of all, when we have a decimal in the denominator, so this, if we look at this first fraction here, that is 1 third, and then I have the 3.4 in the denominator over here. So that's 1 over 3.4. So the 3 times 3.4 gives us 10.2. So we have 1 over 10.2. Now we do not want to leave decimals in the denominator. That's general, um, generally a no-no. We don't leave decimals, we don't leave negatives, and we don't leave fractions in the denominator. So if I wanted to make this be a fraction that was not, um, did not have a decimal in the denominator, what I could do is I could multiply by 10 in both places. So I have 10 over 102 and I could simplify or reduce a little. So that would be 5 over 51. So this first fraction or this first term would look like 5 over 51 x to the 3.4. You could also do this pretty easily on your calculator by taking 1 third times 1 over 3.4 and then having your calculator convert that to a fraction and we get 5 over 51. So let's simplify this second one. So here I've got a 6 in the numerator and I've got a 1 over 3 halves in the denominator, so this is 6 over 1. And when you are taking 1 over a fraction, you need to multiply by its reciprocal. So this is going to be 6 times 2 thirds instead of 3 halves. I can simplify there. That gives me 2, so I end up with 4. Again, on the calculator, we could do that pretty simply by going 6 divided by 3 divided by 2. Notice I've put parentheses in there and I get 4. This next one I have 7 divided by 0.6. Use that trick of multiplying by 10 over 10 so I'd end up with 70 over 6. Reduce that's 35 thirds. And again on the calculator 7 divided by 0.6 convert it to a fraction, and I get 35 thirds. Okay, so pause the video and do the check and see if you get what we originally had. Welcome back. I got the
correct thing. It matches up with what was inside my original integral. Hopefully you did too. Let's look at this one last integral. Here I have um, a couple of terms that I want to make sure to rewrite. This term, I want to separate that factor of 2 from my x, and here I have an x in the denominator, so in my rewrite, I'm going to have 2 to the x minus 1 half times 1 over x plus x to the negative 2 plus 2 dx. You could rewrite this term right here as x to the minus 1 if you wanted. It, it doesn't really matter. Pause the video and see if you can do the antiderivative here. One thing to note is that for that first term, you're going to need to use this exponential rule. So here's my answer. I have 2 to the x over natural log of 2 minus 1 half natural log of absolute value of x minus x to the minus 1 plus 2x plus c. Again, notice that I have done the antiderivative so that integral sign disappears and I have I no longer have that dx but I do have the plus c. One thing I see in student work a lot is they'll do this. They'll put an integral sign equals. I don't want to see that. I'd encourage you also to, to do a check here. So take that derivative of this thing and see if you end up with what we originally had. So finally, let's look at this application problem. So it says the marginal cost of producing the X smartphone is given by 50 plus X over 10,000. And the fixed costs are $100,000. Find the cost function. So our cost function is going to be the integral, the antiderivative of our marginal cost function. So what we're going to have here is the antiderivative of 50 plus x divided by 10,000 dx, and so we need to do the antiderivative. So here, the antiderivative of 50 is just 50x. The antiderivative of this x over 10,000, I'm going to separate that 10,000, so I'm going to think of this 10,000 here. I'm going to think of that as 1 over 10,000, and that's my coefficient. Take the antiderivative of x, that's going to be x squared over 2, and then I have a plus c. So this is my cost function, and this plus c could be a little confusing because I have this c over here. So instead of using c, let's change and use k. So my cost function is going to be 50x plus x squared over 20,000 plus k. Now, we want our actual cost function. I don't want to have a plus k here, so let's see if we can use some other information to figure out what this is. They tell us here that our fixed costs are $100,000. So remember, with fixed costs, that's your cost at zero. So we have our cost at zero is $100,000. So if we plug in zero, we're going to have 50 times zero plus zero squared over 20,000, which is zero plus K. And so this is supposed to equal 100,000. Both of these terms, this term and this term are zero. So I have K equals 100,000. So my cost function is 50x plus x squared over 20,000 plus 100,000. And that is my answer.